Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom or Tom. How's it going? Tony, this feels like the really the first show of next season. Like we we are sort of in that weird transitional period where we're sort of wrapping up 2021 and talking about NFL draft get declarations and uh, you know, guys who may transfer or coaching staff changes and all that kind of stuff. But this is the first one where it's like, ah, entirely new people who have never played at Ohio State before, never been on campus at Ohio State before, are now on campus. It's like I, we're officially like turning the page to 2022. Yeah, classes are starting at Ohio State. So we're going to take a look at the early enrollees this year, which um, I believe uh, from what we've been able to track down, there are 11 of them this year that will take, play, take part in spring and winter workouts and really get the leg up on contributing next season i should have wrote this down Tom. like look at all the guys look at i'll go to denzel burke mm-hmm. travion henderson these these guys who enrolled early and played huge parts in the season didn't marvin harrison and Emeka Gbuka were both in early jane ballard was as well mm-hmm. but the, the sooner you get in unless your name is quinn yours mm-hmm. the sooner you will be able to contribute and uh especially at these skill positions so it, it was you saw what happened. I mean, just the example of Denzel Burke versus Jordan Hancock and Jacalen Johnson. Now, Jacalen Johnson was hurt, but look at Denzel Burke versus Jordan Hancock. Hancock didn't enroll until the summer. Denzel Burke was here in January, and one guy started, the other guy played uh, five or six games, and you never really saw much of them unless it was a blowout. So that gives you an idea. But I, I do wonder. I kind of feel like Denzel Burke would have started anyway. Like if he enrolled in like uh, I don't know August first, like the way he played and, and, and the the uh, the aggression and the confidence he had. But I'm not going to go against my argument that that er, enrolling early helps Tom. I, I, of the guys who showed up last summer, I think JT Tuimolowa was the only one who really played a lot last year. I, I mean, it's that's hard. I mean, think back think back to when you were starting college, like. That is a tough transition. You're you're going, you know, you're you're living away from home for the first time. You're, you know, kind of you're on, on your own for the first time. You're adjusting to new classes and having to, you know, do a lot of stuff for yourself that you didn't have to do. And then you're also leveling up in football at the same time. And you have, you know, you show up in June and you go through some workouts and stuff, but you only have that fall camp in August to to sort of get ready before the season. And really only have the first week or two of that fall camp. Before they really start, you know, setting, you know, get getting the lineup set and all that kind of stuff. There's not a lot of time to make an Im- impact, and then once the season starts, it, there's you know, it's harder to kind of jump guys in the middle of the season. So, being in in the, in the spring definitely makes a difference. Like you said, I mean, and, and Mecca Ibuka, Marvin Harrison, Travion Henderson, uh, Denzel Burke, like all of those guys who were the true freshmen who are really contributing a lot. Those guys, Ty Lake Williams, I think was in last spring, I believe. You know, uh, so. You know, all of those guys you kind of saw a lot last spring are the ones who really made an impact during the fall. And a lot of the guys who came in later, Andre Turrentine, Mike Hall, some of those guys didn't play as, you know, didn't get on the field as much, didn't play as much. A lot of them redshirted in 2021. So, you know, it's a, uh, it, it, it is not for everyone, but if you can do it, it is a big deal. It is a big leg up in terms of getting your career started. Yeah, and unless you're a complete freak like JT Tuimolo who can show up like the Friday before the game and start two weeks later, I mean, that's uh, that's an impressive dude. And so let's discuss. We'll, we'll run down these eleven guys, and um, like, there's been nothing from Ohio State yet that these guys have enrolled, but um, th- these are the eleven that we could track down and feel pretty good about. Um, start with Devin Brown, the quarterback. Obviously, I think he's going to redshirt. You don't need that. You hope you don't need that third quarterback. But I again, and I said this on the last show, I like the fact that he came to Ohio State to compete. He he's he knows who's here. He knows that uh, it's there's going to be people coming after him. And so I like uh, the, the skill set. And this is another example of Ryan Day being able to at the last minute. Like I wonder if this dude ever studied for exams during the week, or if he just waited until the night before because. He can cram quarterbacks better than anybody. Like, oh, uh, oh, I don't have any quarterbacks. Let me, let me see. Oh, here's 
Come on in, Justin Fields. Oh, Quinn Ewers wants to leave. Okay, let me let me get, go get the best quarterback on the West Coast. Please, please come here, Devin Brown. Like this guy is. Uh, it's it's hard to have quarterback concerns as long as Ryan Day is in town. Yeah, it, it just you know quarterback and wide receiver are the two spots right now. It just feels like it's just you know pump them off an assembly line, and it, it makes sense because w- what is the common thread there between those guys? Well, if you're a starter very likely you're going to be a first round pick. Like that's just kind of how it is now. You, you come start with for Ryan day and then you're a first round pick and have worked for Dwayne Haskins. It worked for Justin Fields. CJ Stroud is very much on that same track. You go to the, you go to the Heisman ceremony. You're a Heisman finalist. You probably are a first round NFL draft pick. And then you move on. And even some of the guys who've been under Ryan day's tutelage for a few years, if you're not the guy, he's a good person to learn from for a couple of years. And then you go somewhere else and you can be successful there. I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, that has that has worked out for some guys as well. N- not for everyone, but for for some guys, that's that's been an option. So, yeah, it it is uh, you know, it, it's a it is a very easy thing for Ryan Day to sell. Come to Ohio State, you're gonna you know, if you're the best guy, you're gonna play. You're gonna put up insane numbers, break a bunch of school records, and then go get drafted in the NFL in the first round. Like that's that's a pretty easy thing to sell. Yeah, it's not difficult. You mentioned receivers. So let's go there now. Caleb Burton out of Lake Travis in Texas, the number nine wide receiver in the nation. Another guy who is very much like Garrett Wilson, Jackson Smith, and Jigba, six foot, 100 and whatever, and is not the biggest guy, but just gets open, moves the chains, uh, can probably play uh, multiple positions, and is just productive. And so he'll be in. This winter, this spring, he's already, I saw a tweet from OSU, like he's already moving in. Obviously, classes are starting. But another guy, Tom, that I don't think, red shirts, I don't know where he ends up as a receiver. I, I, I always wonder, like, Brian Hartline, do you have, do you know where everybody's going to be? And, of course, he'd probably say no, even though if he did have a complete idea of where everybody's going to be. You know, I think you bring guys in with the idea that this guy might be an outside guy or this guy might be a slot guy. But I mean, as we saw with Garrett Wilson, like they are willing to move people around. Garrett Wilson started outside, moved inside, went back outside. It just kind of, you know, who are your three best guys? And depending on who the three best guys are, the guy who's the best slot guy of those three is going to be the guy who plays in the slot. And then the other two guys are going to play outside. And you know, he, he I think he's get, he's certainly getting away from bringing someone in specifically to be the slot guy. Because then you're kind of boxed in. If it's just, it's like, well, if there's another good slot guy, then there's not a place for you if you can only play in the slot. So, you know, they're going to, you know, we've used the positionless basketball analogy before. It's kind of positionless basketball where it's like, well, whoever the three best guys are, then we'll just figure out the, figure out the spot on the field. I don't have a great sense. I mean, a lot of these guys are kind of in that same basic physical mold mm-hmm. where it's not, you know, you're not bringing in the six, five guy and also the five, nine guy. There's a lot of guys in just that six foot six two mold where it's like, yeah, you could play inside, you could play outside, like whatever. So yeah, I, those two guys coming in early though, Caleb Burton and Keon Gray's, those, those are guys who I think it, it is not going to be super easy to get on the field. This is going to be a, uh, you know, yet again, it will be a very competitive wide receiver room uh, coming into the spring and going into the fall. But you're you're in that discussion to get in that rotation because as we saw with Emeka Igbuka and Marvin Harrison, even if it takes a little while. All of a sudden, by the end of the year, you're ready to play. Yeah, and with Keon Gray's, like to me, he is the only surefire outside receiver to me. Like I don't think he's going to play inside. Whereas I could see the other three playing inside at some point. So you you think he's kind of like the Z with Jaden Ballard, and is that is that Julian Fleming? Is that going to be a, 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 a Mecca Buka or is that or even uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba? So like. Where is Keon Gray's in all of this? And like I could see him being a right shirt guy just because there's so many different, so many guys in front of him. However, if you go to the positionless basketball thing, then it's you, you just find your top six mm-hmm. and you play them. Uh, but they haven't really been playing six now. Will they get there this year? I think they, they've got a top four and, and you've you better play a top four or else you're probably going to lose somebody mm-hmm. is, is Jaden Ballard going to be ready to be that number five guy. And, you know, I I've seen people asking about Cameron Babb at this point. Um, you know, I, I don't know that you can expect him to be a part of a, a rotation 
if he's on the team, if he's playing special teams, that's great. You, you just don't know how, how the knees have held up. Like he's captain, he's going to grad school. He's done all of the, everything right. But all of these other guys coming in are healthy and they've been healthy and they have uh, all of, they're just advanced athletically. So uh, is, is there room for a sixth guy like either of these guys or Kojo Antwi or Caleb um, Brown? Like you, you're going to have to, or, or time is it just going to be the, one of those things where there's, there's enough, you don't need a sixth guy, but you can play each of these guys four games and, you know, filter them through. I, I think it may end up being that because, you, you're you not going to need, I mean, these are all guys who are talented enough that they could come in and play. And if, you know, if you were playing at Illinois, all of these guys are starting receivers this year. Like these are all big 10 caliber receivers right now. So you don't, you know, but, but Ohio state is very famously not Illinois. It's a little <laughs> harder to get on the field at Ohio state than it is at Illinois or Indiana or wherever else you want to compare them to in the big 10. I, I don't, I don't expect you're going to burn a ton of red shirts there. But, you know, maybe you can be strategic about it where you're you're giving guys, you know, you're not just playing a guy in a game to play a guy in a game. You're playing a guy in a game when he can get four or five targets, really be a part of the game, game plan a little bit more. The big question here in terms of how many of these guys get on the field to me, you mentioned the top four. The big question to me is that number five guy is Jaden is Jaden Ballard. You know, we didn't see a whole heck of a lot of him in 2021. They like him. He's a very talented receiver. I mean, we have, you know, he was a masculine wide receiver who wore number nine and ran a lot of deep routes. So, you know, the comp that gets thrown on him all the time. And it's like, yeah, if he can turn into Devin Smith, like, yeah, that's a, that's a guy they'd really like to have. I think he needed a year to grow and, and develop a little bit. And so what is he going to look like this spring? This is, you know, every year we put together the list of like the guys who, this is a very big spring for this guy. This is a very big spring for Jaden Ballard because even though it's only his second year, there's a lot of talent coming behind him. And these are, you know, these are guys who could be immediate impact players in a lot of cases. If you get passed by them, it's going to be hard to pass them again, but you know, with you having a year head start. So I, you know, this is, this is a very, very big spring for Jaden Ballard. I am very, very interested to see how, you know, how he looks this spring as uh, you know, because we, you know, we, we don't get to watch a whole lot of practice at this point. And, so we really haven't seen anything from him since almost the summer. So, you know, I, I am going to be very, very interested to see what he what he looks like with a full season of development, another, you know, year in the winter conditioning program, and then go into spring. Where is he? Is he kind of pushing those top four guys, or is he getting pushed from the guys who are behind him? Yeah, and people who have seen him will rave about his athleticism and just the, the raw ability that is being refined. He had what, one catch this year for four yards. I'm not going to be surprised at all to start hear, hearing him as a guy who is really coming on, getting stronger, uh, just being more impressive uh, in, in the offseason workouts to where you think, oh, like he's ready to blossom. But again, it's hard to blossom when you're the fourth or fifth guy. Just ask Jamison Williams, who mm-hmm. was the third guy uh, in 2020. 20, yes, 2020, 20, 20, and then uh, only got caught like, I don't know, 12 passes or something and, and had to leave because it wasn't enough. And then the third guy this year for Ohio State catches, I don't know, like 65 passes, whatever. <laughs> you know, it's neither here nor there, Tom, neither here nor there. But let's, let's move to tight end Bennett Christian because this is interesting to me. I don't think Cade Stover is going back to offense. No. And that position is wide open. Bennett Christian making the decision to enroll early might be the wisest of, uh, of any of these early enrollees because he's going to have an opportunity to get in on the ground floor, compete head-to-head with Joe Royer, Sam Hart, G. Scott, Mitch Rossi, these guys to to convince the coaches that to not only convince coaches that he can play, but also to learn and to get stronger and to become a better blocker, because obviously he's going to have to block to play well. You're going to be the best blocker. He's already like, he's like 6'6", 240. He's only going to get bigger. He's probably getting bigger right now, just, you know, even heading into college to where he might, he might be that number two tight end and could grow into that number one tight end sooner than later if the development of the other guys doesn't 
step up. Now we heard really good things about Joe Royer in, in the bull practice, which I think also allowed them to move Kate Stover without much concern, but that's going to need to continue. Uh, but I, I, re- I really like this decision by Christian to come in early and they had two tight ends in this class. They ended with just one and he's, he's got a really big opportunity to be a, a, like a major point of the Ohio state offense. And maybe not, not a major point, but have a major role. Not, not have a lot of footballs thrown at him, if that's what you're suggesting. But yeah, no, he's, he's someone who this is as wide open an opportunity as you're going to get because Jeremy Ruckert's off the NFL. Cade Stover, it definitely sounds like is sticking on defense, whether that's a defensive end or linebacker, we'll see, but you know, G Scott is someone who they're very high on, but he's still, you know, he's, he's not necessarily going to be the big blocking tight end. Like uh, Bennett Christian may have the opportunity to be, you know, number one or number two in terms of like the blocking guy, unless you want to count Mitch Rossi in there, which, you know, maybe, maybe you're counting Mitch Rossi in there too, but you know, Royer, Royer, I think would come into 2022 as the number one guy to me. I think that's what I'm expecting. And then if, you know, if G Scott is going to be more like, you know, split him out and, you know, flex him out kind of tight, tight end rather than the hand in the dirt tight end, that leaves things wide open for Matt Christian to be kind of an immediate contributor. So, yeah, I, I'm, this is, a, you know, of, he is not the biggest name. He was one of the lower rated players in the class. But he also is someone who might have not the easiest path to the field, but one of the more clear paths to the field to at least contribute this fall, where he's someone I would not necessarily expect to redshirt this year, even though he is, like I said, he you know, was a three-star guy. He is not the, you know, the guy who's got his name up on the marquee in the, in the you know, as they're uh, you know, revealing the recruiting class, but he may be someone who has a relatively clear path to the field to be at least a contributor this fall. Yeah, it's, he is the second lowest rated prospect in the class, only ahead of Avery Henry. But Ben Christian is also just, he's the number 378 player in, in the, the composite, the number 18 tight end. So it's not like we're talking about somebody in the 800s. <laughs> like, yeah, this would be uh, several Big Ten's top two or three recruit, several Big Ten mm-hmm. teams. Um, and, and it is interesting that he is a three star and yet could very well be one of the the top tight ends for the Buckeyes next year and and really just really good size, really good attitude. And I mean when a tight end comes to Ohio State to play tight end, kind of tells you that I'm not looking for 80 passes. I like to block. I'm I'm okay being physical. And uh, so that's where he is. Let's move to George Fitzpatrick, the uh, offensive tackle out of Colorado. We know Ohio State does Great luck out in Colorado with their offensive linemen. So uh, George Fitzpatrick coming in early, the number 26 tackle in the nation. Anytime an offensive lineman comes in who isn't uh, like Paris Johnson, you just expect that they're going to redshirt. Like mm-hmm. Dewan Jones not redshirting was one of the bigger shocks of the last <laughs> few years for Ohio mm-hmm. State, and especially when it looked like he was only going to play because of his ability to block extra points and field goals. And then he just kept getting better and better. And it's like, you know what? We're not, we're not going to redshirt him. But you see guys like Nicholas Petit Frere redshirted and so many other guys, offensive lines, just kind of assumed. And I'm going to assume the same thing for George Fitzpatrick, who uh, you know, when we talk about who is going to be that tackle in 2023, I don't know that anybody is saying him. Maybe we should, but uh, I, I'm not going to be doing I'm not there yet. Well, he's someone who is 6'6". Mark Givler was down at the All-American game and got, got to see him in person. Yes, he is a legitimate 6'6". Like sometimes those 6'6 guys are listed at 6'6", and they're really like, yeah, I'm not really looking up at this person that much. So I don't think you're actually 6'6". <laughs> like Fitzpatrick's a legitimate 6'6", which is, you know, you kind of need that as a tackle. But he's at 274. Like you are not playing tackle in the Big Ten at 274 pounds. I'm very sorry, but it is not 1985 anymore. So he's going to need at least a year to kind of bulk up and, and uh, you know, work on, you know, start, start developing your technique and all that kind of stuff. He's someone who Mark thinks could legitimately be a tackle. That is, you know, he's not someone who's definitely kicking inside the guard. He's got the tackle frame and now it's just, you know, put, put him in the program and now, uh, you know, set, set the timer for 18 months to 
30 months or so and then we'll see we'll see where we are uh sometime in uh, summer of 2023 or summer of 2024 and and see where see where it goes from there but you kind of you have the ingredients and now you have to see how the you know how the recipe all comes out at this point that's that's just kind of how offensive linemen are uh and but given the the need coming around the bend pretty quickly you might want to go with an instapot rather than a crock pot <laughs> like you don't have all day we need yeah. just like 90 minutes yeah, so and, yeah and you definitely you definitely have you know he's someone the conversation we just had about Bennett Christian where it's like you know not necessarily the the highest rated player in the class but there may be a path to the field there. The path to the field is not this year because he's not going to be ready physically. He's, you know, you, you got to spend a year bulking up a little bit more. But when the path to the field is there, potentially in 23, maybe, then you've got, you know, th- there is a path there. And, you know, at that point, maybe he's more physically ready and, and we'll kind of we'll kind of see at that point. Let's move to Caden Curry, defensive lineman out of Greenwood, Indiana, Santa Grove High School who I remember when I went to see him in 2020, he was listed, I think, at uh, 6'5", 250 as a defensive tackle. And I got there, and the first thing I noticed was, like, this dude is not 6'5", 250 pounds. I, I, I would have eyeballed him as a carnival barker at, if I were the carnival barker. Not him. I didn't eyeball him <laughs> as a carnival barker, but I would have said he's probably like 6'2", 240. And then you watch him play, and he's just better than everybody. And it's like, I don't care. doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if he's 6'2, 240, 6'2, 260. Right now, 24 7 lists him as 6'3, 250. He, I'll give him 6'2 and a half. Maybe he's grown, but I don't care because he's, he's relentless. He gets into the backfield. He's one of these guys that is he's all effort, but he's also really talented. And when you put those two together, size uh, you know, on the defensive line, they can make up for it. And again, if, if he's playing defensive end, which it looks like he, he, he will be. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm okay with that. And he showed the quickness. He showed enough speed because that was also my concern. He's a defensive tackle in high school last year. How does that? Can he can he actually rush the, the passer from the outside from the edge when it takes twice as long to get there as it does? Because I'm telling you, when he was playing de- defensive tackle at Center Grove, split seconds. Uh, he he's past the guard in the center. He splits him, and the quarterback is like, "Thanks, guys," and has to bail out. So when when you're then coming from the outside. It takes longer. It's uh, there are more ways to deal with them, and uh, I, I wanted to see how he held up, and he's still doing just fine. So, I, I I'm really not going to put much doubt on him. I don't know what it means for this year because they do have quite a few defensive ends, assuming Zach Harrison is back, and then they can do some different things. Uh, but I could see him playing as much as Jack Sawyer, maybe. Yeah, he's someone who I think has the opportunity to be on the field immediately or at least be in the rotation immediately. He might not have the highest upside of all any of the guys in this class, but he might be kind of the most college ready of any of the defensive ends that they're bringing in. So, yeah, he's he's someone who I I think could push to get on the field this fall and and you know, starting is probably not realistic cuz you've got, you know, we'll we'll see they the you know guys who may or may not come back. There's still a couple of those up in the air, but you have a lot of you have a lot of talent in that in that defensive end room. So you're not you know there is not an immediate like boy you walk onto campus you're the number two guy like you might you might walk onto campus and earn your way up to being the number five guy or the number six guy potentially. But if you're the number five guy or number six guy, like okay that's that's pretty good. You are jumping guys who are probably ahead of you, you know guys who are you know have been at Ohio State for a few years. He, he's someone who I expect to see on the field this fall. Maybe he red shirts, maybe, but you know, he, again, he's someone who I think if you're going to red shirt, I'm like, give, make the most of those four games. Don't just, you know, play him for two snaps against uh, who's the terrible team they're playing out of conference this year. Oh, Notre Dame. That's right. No, I'm kidding. Kidding, 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 kidding. I forget which Mac team they have on the schedule this fall. It might be Bowling Green, but you know, whoever, you know, whoever the Mac team is like, you're not necessarily just playing him for four snaps against that team and, and uh, three snaps against, you know, Rutgers or whatever, Ma- make the most of it. But I do, I think he, he's someone who has an opportunity to not redshirt potentially, you know, he could, he could be the guy out of this class who, who, who plays six, seven games. If, uh, if things break, right. 
Yeah, and when I say he plays as much as Jack Sawyer, I'm talking Jack Sawyer as a freshman, not Jack Sawyer y- yes, as a yes, sophomore, just yes. so everybody knows, because uh, I'm, I'm sure people would respond to that. Let's, let's talk about Gabe Powers, because he might be a, for me, he's probably a redshirt candidate to figure out what exactly he's going to be. Kind of like maybe a Cade Stover, where well, what's he going to grow into? And then also, can, if he is a linebacker, they don't really have a spot for him necessarily because like, are they still trying to figure out what this defense does now? If, if he comes in and they're like, Oh, he's one of these playmakers, like Jim Knowles sees him and is like, Oh, I, I, I got something for him. That would be an incredible sign of just the, the potential there. But for me, I think he probably red shirts. He's a bigger linebacker. You've got Mitchell Melton. You, you probably have poly now to uh, you've and again, I'm still still trying to figure out what this defense is going to look like. The the outside linebacker situation, Diamante Trainum, like Court Williams, I, who knows? But I'm I'm if I'm going to say yay or nay on a redshirt for Gabe Powers, I'm probably going to say redshirt because I don't know what else to do with him right now. But I also don't know what to do with the defense. Yeah, and and he, there's there's just there's so many variables here with Powers. It's like, what does his body do? You know, is he and and Mickey Marotti may have an answer on this uh, that that we don't know yet. But, you know, a lot of times we, we've talked to Mick in the past and it's like, you just, you know, he's looking at certain stuff and going, if, you know, if this guy has this traits, you know, these physical traits, like, OK, I can he can hold more weight. I mean, we'll see. We'll see what what he thinks about Gabe Powers when Gabe Powers gets in. But, you know, you've got the the physical development for powers. You also have just the. The defense, like where does he does he have what the traits are looking for as a linebacker, or is he a Leo? I mean, I feel like Leo is the bucket that we just throw everyone in, and uh, you know, I, I'm not. We haven't talked to Knowles yet, but my suspicion is you can't actually play 15 guys at Leo at once. So I mean, at some point, like <laughs> you can't throw everyone in that bucket all at the same time. So uh, it, it is it is uh, he, he's a little bit of a mystery where he's a, a good athlete. He is the he is the proverbial coach's kid who you know is going to come in and be you know mentally ready to play wherever he's asked to play. So I, I'm uh, yeah I, I'm he is of all the people on this list I think outside of uh, you know outside of safety where it's just kind of like everything is just the uh, the gif of the guy looking at the camera and like that with the question marks around him. That's that's just me trying to figure out the safety depth chart for this year, but. Yeah, outside of the, that spot, Gabe Powers is kind of the most like, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that could impact uh, where he ends up that we have no idea right now. Tom, why don't they make the entire plane out of the Leo position? Mm, you might have some problems in pass coverage, but you would really create some, uh, you know, maybe you can make up for it with pass rush. I mean, that's uh, it's it's intriguing. I'm, I, I am. Uh, I find your ideas intriguing and wish to subscribe to your newsletter. Uh, I was just looking up. Ryan Shazier's 2011 stats as a true freshman. Why? Because let's talk about CJ Hicks, Tom. Now, Ryan Shazier, 56 tackles as a true freshman in 2011, didn't really become a major focus of the defense until games uh, like eight through the last four games, whatever that accounts to. 56 tackles. Those last four games, 40 tackles. That's where like he started taking over. I when I watch CJ Stroud or CJ Hicks, I see quite a bit of Ryan Chase here. I don't know that I see that happening next year. But like what is how established are the linebacker positions? I think is Steel Chambers like I think Steel Chambers will have more competition next next year than he did this year and um, that competition this year was just to Roger Mitchell, and he, he didn't provide much competition because Steel Chambers came in and took the job. But CJ Hicks, for me, I think he's a guy you put on special teams, let him do some stuff there, let him get his feet wet, find some snaps for him on defense here and there. I I do wonder, you know how like Larry Johnson likes to put guys, let, let's get some freshmen some run here and there. Can Will Jim Knowles do that for CJ Hicks? Like, I want let, to, let's make some easy plays for him. Go get the quarterback. Just, you know, just easy stuff, point and click, go get the quarterback here, go get the ball. Just, you know, 
I don't know, eight times a game, like not just eight blitzes, but like mm-hmm. eight plays a game to see what he can do. Yeah. He's someone who I, I would be very surprised if CJ Hicks redshirted because he does fit the mold of like, he is the special teams assassin guy. So you're, you're playing him on kick returns or punt coverage or whatever it is. So, okay. If you're going to do that now, you now he's not redshirting. So now he's, you know, now you might as well find, find something for him to do on the defense. And you know, he's, he's someone, he's a smart kid. So I think, I don't think he's going to have a terrible time picking up the defense and, you know, there is an opportunity in that linebacker room. Do not expect him to start. Everyone is going to, you know, he will be the guy who lots of people are throwing around. Like, could CJ Hicks start? Like I, we're going to over under 12 and a half people who ask us on listener question shows, uh, will CJ Hicks start a game this year over under 12 and a half? I'm going to go over because I'll have Langdon Alger asking it about nine times. And it's going to be, you know, I maybe like maybe towards the end of the year, maybe he is not going to be Andy Katz and Warrior walking out of campus and starting the first game. I don't think that's a reasonable thing to expect with, you know, there are other linebackers on the team and it's a new defense and he's coming in as a true freshman. And I mean, like he's, you know, he is going to be a very, very, very good player at Ohio State. He's not going to start day one, I don't think. So, but he's he's someone who I'm with you. Like, if you're going to play him on special teams, you might as well see what he can do on defense and work him in on defense and put him in some situations to succeed and gradually become more of a contributor as the year goes along. I think I think that's a very smart way to use him this year. And I I have a feeling that that is how they are going to use him. Yeah, because if he's behind Steel Chambers for like two years or maybe longer like that's kind of a waste of landing the number one linebacker in the class uh but uh, we'll see let's let's just j- lump all three of these next guys together in the defensive backfield ryan turner jair brown his corners kai stokes as the safety um for me like if i if you're asking me which of these three guys am i thinking makes the biggest contribution next year it's it's really hard for me not to compare ryan turner to denzel burke and i don't know if that's just because of their similar rankings and maybe being under the radar but um i I think ryan turner i I just maybe maybe it's the idea of the similarities of denzel burke and like who who, you know you lose all of these five-star guys and then it's still Oh, but don't forget about this one guy right here. And then he ends up playing the most. I don't know that any of these guys will play more than four games next year. I'm probably red shirting them all unless somebody just is too good to keep up field. But you figure you've got Denzel Burke, you've got Cameron Brown, probably have Legend Cavazos, J.K. Johnson, Jordan Hancock. I don't think there's a need for another corner uh, to to lose a year of eligibility. I think those two guys, red shirt. Kai Stokes, I mean, we've already talked about how many safeties there are. Like, mm-hmm. if if he's one of the four or five best, sure. Mm-hmm. But I don't, you know, I, I don't. Maybe he will be because let's 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 not <laughs> pretend like the safeties are all that outstanding. Like, he very mm-hmm. well could be. But uh, I know Bill Green is is really high on Kai Stokes, so that'll be a guy that I'll, I'll be interested in paying attention to this spring and this winter as we hear stuff about these guys. But. I'm I'm going to assume that the corner is red shirt, and then I'll I'll reserve judgment on Kai Stokes for now. Yeah, I I, I think I'm gonna vote present on this, and uh, not <laughs> not a thumbs up or thumbs down on any of these guys. Like, I, I think a a red shirt is a default uh, position on pretty much all these guys. Give, I mean, give, like you said, given the depth ahead of them, there's no reason to rush them unless they give you a reason to put them on the field. Give them a year. Let them work, you know, refine their technique a little bit. We still don't officially know who's coaching the corners, who's coaching the safeties this year. You may have a whole different, uh, you know, a whole different coaching staff back there. You may bring in, you know, bring Kerry Combs back. That's still a little bit up in the air right now. They're, again, this is you're asking a lot for guys to come on campus, learn a new defense while everyone else is learning the defense because you don't have. You know, we talked on yesterday's show about uh, uh, Tanner McAllister kind of being able to teach some of the other safeties. You don't have that in the corner room because all the all the veteran corners still have to learn from you know whoever the new new corner coach is or if it's Kerry Combs again, but you're still learning you're still learning the the Knowles defense and and some of the you know all that concepts. You're not going to be able to lean on the older guys because the older guys are going to be learning it too. So this is going to be I think a tougher year to get on the field right away as a as a young guy. So 
yeah, I, I would sort of default to all of those guys, red shirt. And then if one of them doesn't, well, then that'll really tell me something about that guy. Yeah. Well said, uh, Tom, anything else before we call it a day? No, I think we're, uh, I think we're out of early and rolly freshmen. So I think we're done. I think we are done, Tom. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, that's uh, it, it. Yeah. Tom, is it officially now the 20, when we say uh, this season, last season, when, now, when we say this season, are we talking 2022? I think we're officially? talking to, I think we're talking 2022. I think we have officially turned the page and there, there will still be some uh, looks back and, yeah. and uh, some changes to be made and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I think, I think officially this season is now this upcoming season. It's one of my ultimate pet peeves and we'll get out of here. But when coaches are talking during spring about next season, and they say next season, I'm like, whoa, that is way out of bounds. <laughs> I can understand doing it in January. You cannot, and even signing day February, but in the spring, you cannot be talking. I don't understand when they're talking about next season. That's, I, I don't, I don't like that. I, I, it should, my one goal in lifetime is for all coaches to get all coaches to in unison, not necessarily in unison. But in solidarity, say this season when discussing football past spring. Definitely the biggest problem facing college football right now. So, yes, if we can just get that one solved, do they give a Nobel Prize for college football? Because if they do, I know who I'm nominating. Nobel Prize for semantics. Sign me up. (laughs) All right. That will do it for the show. Thank you guys for tuning in. And we will talk to you later.